Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Thursday Night Bible Basics. My name is Dan, and I'm so glad that you're here. We are kicking off the New Testament tonight. We have spent many, many, many months going through the Old Testament. We've done it. We've made it through that part of the Bible, and now we get to the part that's really exciting, the part that I just can't wait to talk about with you guys, the New Testament, the stories, the teachings of Jesus. And we're starting, of course, with the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel according to Matthew. Now, the word gospel is a word that means good news, right? That's all it means. It means good news. And uh, this good news is the good news of Jesus. It's the good news of his grace and his teaching and his salvation in our lives. Now, if you're like, Dan, I really want to sound like I know what I'm talking about when it comes to the Bible, then when you're talking about the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, always refer to them as the Gospel according to and then the author. So the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to John, the Gospel according to Luke or Mark. And the reason is, when we say, the gospel of Matthew, what we're saying is it's the good news of Matthew, but it's not the good news of Matthew. It's the good news of Jesus according to Matthew. So anyway, we, if you say that around like religious people, they'll be like, whoa, this guy knows his stuff, right? So anyway, gospel according to Matthew. That's what we're talking about tonight. And you guys must be excited about talking about the New Testament because we have more questions submitted tonight than we have had for any of our other books so far, even Genesis. And Genesis had a lot of questions, let me tell you. So I'm super excited to dive in. But because we have so many questions, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. Number one, there is still always time for you to drop your questions in the comments. So by all means, say hello, chat with other people in the comment feed. And if you have questions regarding the, the Bible, the New Testament, the book of Matthew, or anything about faith or God, then uh, drop them in the comments and I'd be glad to answer them. Because we have so many questions, my answers might be a little bit shorter than they typically are. I'm going to drop through them really, really quick. And uh, yeah, you know, if it's not quite enough and you want a little more explanation, then I can always address that in another uh, video that we do. Or you can always make a comment and say, bro, you still didn't answer my question. Help me out some more and we can go back to it. So let's dive in here. And uh, we got a new little feature that maybe will help you a little bit. I've got the questions on the screen, so you guys know what the heck we're talking about. If you jump in late, then uh, you'll still get a sense of what the question is. So the first one that was submitted starts with really one of the very first characters we meet in the book of Matthew. The question is this, was John the Baptist the first one to baptize people, or was the word baptism and the act of baptism something that Jewish people uh, in that culture were already familiar with? That's a great question. John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. He kind of started preaching and baptizing people in the wilderness. And so the question here is, did he invent baptism? Did people know what the heck he was talking about when he told them to be baptized? Uh, yes, they did. And no, he did not invent baptism. Uh, baptism is an ancient rite, and it's a part of nearly every religious tradition. And it was a longstanding part of Judaism as well. And so Jews had been for thousands of years doing this ritual washing of themselves. And they called it a mikvah. It was a, a bath that they would take and, and a way of formally cleansing themselves. And so it's a little bit different than what JTB was doing when he just dunked people under the water and yanked them back up. But um, there was precedent. And so when he told them to be baptized, they totally understood the symbolism there. Just as a quick point of clarification, in case you've ever wondered this, baptism is a symbol. Baptism doesn't actually save us. So like when we baptize people at the movie theater on Sunday mornings, it's a lot of fun. We rent a hot tub. We put it right in the lobby of the movie theater and we dunk people in there. There's nothing special about that water. It literally comes from a mop sink there in the uh, kitchen at the movie theater. But you know what? The water symbolizes the fact that we have been cleansed from our sins by Jesus. And so baptism is an important thing. John the Baptist was the first one to kick it off in the New Testament, but it had roots going back for many, many years. Good question. All right. The next one that you guys submitted also has to deal with John the Baptist. And a little shorthand here, JTB just means John the Baptist. So anyway, the question is this, what was the point of John the Baptist's ministry? Why did someone have to come before Jesus? Didn't Jesus' ministry just speak for itself? 
That is a really interesting question, and I think there are a lot of possible answers for it. Number one, every MC needs a hype man, and John the Baptist was Jesus' hype man. He was the one who kind of got the crowds ready for Jesus and the things that he was going to say and do. Of course, Jesus wasn't a battle rapper. John the Baptist wasn't actually his hype man. But John the Baptist did serve an important function of preparing the way, letting people know that something special was about to happen. Additionally, if you go back in the Old Testament, in fact, in the Minor Prophets that we read just a, a few weeks ago, I forget which one it was. It could have been Obadiah, could have been Zechariah, who even knows. Um, but in one of these uh, Old Testament Minor Prophets, there was a prediction that there would be a forerunner to the Messiah. And this was a clue that whoever it was that claimed to be the Messiah, this was the real deal. He was actually the one because there was this prophet that came before him and uh, his messages were accompanied by signs and miracles and authority and that sort of thing. And so it was kind of like, you know, there are going to be a lot of people that claim to be God's son, claim to be special and anointed. But if you look for the one who's preceded by an authoritative prophet, somebody who really turns people's hearts towards God, that's a symbol that the guy you're looking at is the actual Messiah. So that was John the Baptist's function. And that's why he, uh, he was there. To say, didn't Jesus' ministry speak for itself? Well, the answer is sure. It definitely spoke for itself. But this was just another layer of confirmation. It was another fulfilled prophecy. And so, yeah, it was giving people confidence that Jesus really was God in the flesh, God's son come to earth. He wasn't merely just a wise man, but he was the fulfillment of predictions and prophecies that had been made hundreds of years before. So that's a little bit about John the Baptist. Okay. Next question is this, uh, why does John the Baptist question if Jesus is the Messiah after paving the way for his ministry, baptizing Jesus, seeing and hearing, hearing the Spirit come upon Jesus, following his baptism? So this reference is uh, John, uh, Matthew chapter number 11. I'll put it here on the screen in case you're not familiar with the passage. And uh, here in Matthew 11, the Bible tells us in verse number 2, John the Baptist eventually finds himself in prison, okay? And the reason that he's in prison is because he had been preaching against Herod, who was the governor of their region. He had been speaking truth to power. Herod and his wife did not like what he had to say. So in order to silence him, they put him in jail. And while he's in jail, the Bible says he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told the messengers that came on behalf of John, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. Tell him that blind people see and lame people walk and those with leprosy are cured. Tell him the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life and the good news, the gospel, there's that word again, the gospel is being preached to the poor. And then he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. So this is this really interesting moment. And if John the Baptist had seen Jesus, you know, preach and work miracles, if he baptized him and told everybody who was there, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, why is it that a few months later, he suddenly seems to be full of doubt? He's not sure and he's questioning things. Well, I think what this gives us is a window into John the Baptist and just how desperate and dire his circumstances have become. He, you know, had been riding the high of being the most famous preacher in Israel, and then Jesus comes on the scene and kind of that mantle is handed off. Then John the Baptist becomes incredibly persecuted, and he's thinking to himself, wait a sec, I was special. I was chosen. I was the forerunner. I was the voice of one in the wilderness. I was like Elijah incarnate, not really incarnate, but I was like the pattern of Elijah being fulfilled. And so how is it that I'm in jail? And he eventually gets his head cut off. And so he knows all of this stuff is coming. And you can just get a sense from his words there that he's starting to have fears. He's starting to have doubts. He's starting to have, you know, some problems and issues. And, uh, you know, some the, the circumstances in his life are causing him to doubt the things that he believes about Jesus. So this is actually really encouraging because if John the Baptist, who saw all the things he did, if he can have doubts, then it's probably okay if you and I have a few doubts as well. What we want to do is we want to focus on Jesus' answer to John. Jesus says, hey, look at all the things that we're accomplishing. Look at the way the gospel is being uh, preached. Look at the way the kingdom of God is expanding. And then he tells John, 
Uh, God blesses those who do not fall away. So stay strong, buddy. I know this isn't going the way that you thought it would, but I want you to know you've put your faith in me and I will not let you down. In the end, you will be vindicated. And of course, we know that he was. Although he died, he was beheaded. The truth is, John the Baptist is in heaven with God. We remember his name. We celebrate his ministry. And uh, yeah, Jesus really was able to accomplish a lot of his early ministry because of the credibility he gained from his cousin, John the Baptist. So there you go. That's a little bit about why John the Baptist had this crisis of faith later in his life. All right, next question here says this. Um, okay, so uh, the question is, there are a couple of miraculous things in Matthew that I just have a hard time visualing. Maybe you can help or give your interpretation of what you think it would have looked like uh, and been like. So the first one is this, uh, Jesus is baptized and there's a literal voice from heaven. When you read in Matthew chapter number three, Jesus gets baptized, he comes up. The Bible says a spirit descends on him like a dove and a voice comes from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you think this was like a booming voice? Behold, this is my son. Or uh, do you think it's a booming voice that, you know, everyone within a square mile heard? Or was it more of a private whisper to those at the scene? Uh, great question. The truth is we have no idea, Kyle. No clue whatsoever. Uh, my guess is it was probably more localized because there were no reports of people hearing this sonic boom or this voice from the clouds, you know, throughout the city of Jerusalem. And so my guess is that it was probably localized just to the people that were there, but we really have no way of knowing. We don't know what God's voice sounds like. We don't know how thunderous it would have been or how far it would have traveled or if it was an internal thing. We, we just don't have any clue. Along those same lines, Kyle asks uh, this question. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, there are a couple of times he feeds large crowds, but in particular, uh, he feeds the 5,000. How do you keep just tearing the same loaf of bread enough times to feed 5,000 people? Was it like you tear off a loaf, you hand it to a person to eat, and poof, that loaf is whole again, and then you just repeat the process over and over and over again? The Bible tells us that there was a time in which Jesus fed the multitudes, and he had a few fish and a couple of loaves of bread, and he started pulling, he had the disciples actually, started pulling pieces and passing them out to people so that they would have something to eat, and they fed thousands of people off of a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, and Kyle's question is like, how does that work? Um, I don't know. There, you know, the Bible doesn't give us those details. It wasn't like, you know, the bread. We just don't even know. Uh, we do know that it was miraculously enough to feed everybody. And we see these sorts of miracles happening several times throughout Scripture. If you go back into the Old Testament, there was a time when a widow had only enough oil for a couple of meals, and yet God miraculously provided for her so that her oil lasted far longer than it should have. We read about the oil lasting, uh, you know, in the lamps during the, uh, the time of the Maccabean Revolt. That's really not a story that's told in the Bible, but it's kind of this consistent pattern in which God takes the little bit that we have and in some miraculous way, he allows it to go far further than it would have on its own. What did that look like in the moment? I think it's a great question. I think it's a lot of fun to guess, but in the end, we don't really know. All right. Another question that you guys had was this one. Uh, the word apostle, the word disciple is used a lot in the New Testament, specifically in the Gospels. So what's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? What's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Well, they're two very similar words, but they have slightly different meanings. So the word disciple, it means a learner, somebody who is an apprentice, somebody who is studying and following what somebody else is teaching. That's what it means to be a disciple. Um, it's kind of based on the same word as discussion. If you notice that disc, that D-I-S-C uh, at the front, it's about conversation, it's about information, it's about growing in knowledge, okay? Then an apostle, the word apostle means one who is sent out, somebody who is sent out. Now, when we think about the uh, what it means to follow Jesus, we are all disciples and apostles. We are all growing in our knowledge and understanding of Jesus, and we are all sent out by God to be agents of change and love, truth, and justice in the world. So disciple and apostle are basically two sides of the same coin. One is about internal growth, 
and knowledge and learning. The other is about going into the world and putting all of that in, into practice in such a way that people's lives are changed. Now, where it does get a little interesting is that the, uh, the phrase or the designation disciple and apostle is used interchangeably for all of the uh, 12 in the scripture or 13 or 14, depending on how you count it, because technically there were 12, but Judas killed himself. So then they selected Matthias to replace him. And then uh, later, Paul actually refers to himself as an apostle as well. So anyway, we've got these 12 or 13, 14 guys that were especially close to Jesus. And while they were all certainly disciples, when we talk about the apostles, capital T, capital A, we're generally talking about the original 12 or maybe including uh, Matthias, the guy who replaced Judas. So yeah, usually we refer to those 12 as the apostles, but if you call them the 12 disciples, pfft, no big deal. So that's a little bit about the difference between disciple and apostle. Good question, man. All right. Uh, in Matthew chapter number four, verse 18, we kind of have one of the calling of the uh, disciples. And so the question is this, why were the first disciples so fast to follow Jesus? The book hasn't described much of Jesus' ministry yet, and he doesn't really say anything to them. He doesn't propose anything to them. He doesn't promise anything to them. Instead, he just says, hey, come follow me. And we read about how these guys leave their nets or they leave their businesses and they just immediately get up and leave with Jesus. So what's going on? Why were they so quick to do this? And uh, the person who submitted the question says, am I missing something? Why were they so quick? to get up and to go follow. Well, um, there are a few things that you need to consider. The first is, like, this could just be a straight-up miracle, okay? Like, this is God speaking to us, and it could have just been a miraculous work of God that their hearts were changed in the moment, and they said yes, and they didn't even consider saying no. Like, that's a distinct possibility. The Scripture doesn't really tell us that, but it's entirely possible. Another way to look at this is Jesus could have been so compelling. He could have been so amazing, wonderful. There could have just been something about him that when people saw him or, you know, when this group of people saw him, they were like, I got to follow this guy. There is no way that I could say no to him. But interestingly, there were lots of other people that said no to Jesus. They didn't find anything super compelling about him. And so I don't know if there was something special in the minds and hearts of the 12 who did get up and follow him or if something else was going on. There's another way of thinking about this, and um, I first heard uh, this kind of uh, this kind of argument from a, a former pastor named Rob Bell, and basically what he argued was in in Jewish society in the first century, every boy aspired to be a rabbi or a rabbi in training. It was one of the greatest honors that you could ever uh, you know find to be bar mitzvahed and then to show such a devotion to God and such an aptitude for learning that you would be invited to train under a rabbi until you became a rabbi yourself. So we've got disciples here, and we don't know exactly how old they are. They're probably young. Like these guys are probably in their late teens, early 20s for the most part when Jesus first meets them. And so what that means is uh, they had already been passed over by all the other rabbis in their community. All the rabbis around had, they had known John and they had known James and they had known, you know, these other apostles and, and they said, look, you're a good kid, but you should be a fisherman or you should go be a tent maker or something like that. I don't think you're really cut out to be a follower of a rabbi. So then we fast forward a few years and these guys are out working in their occupations and suddenly a rabbi walks by and although the Bible hasn't really told us a lot about Jesus' ministry up to this point, it is very early, it wasn't like the first week or anything. He had already performed several miracles. He was teaching in a way that was garnering interest. I believe at this point there were already people that were talking about Jesus and so it's entirely possible that the 12 apostles had at least heard rumblings of this Jesus guy. And so anyway, he shows up on the scene. He looks at these guys who had already been deemed not good enough, and he says to them, hey, I want to be your rabbi, and I want you to come follow me. If that is what happened, this could have been a really... I don't know. I mean, it could have been very exciting for these guys, right? Like they thought they had a chance. 
then they lost it, and then they got another chance. There was a rabbi, and it seemed like a special rabbi, who was suddenly paying attention to them, who was saying, I see something in you that nobody else sees, and I want you to come follow me, and we'll help develop that out of you. So I think all of those are possibilities as to why the disciples were so quick to drop everything and to go follow Jesus. Maybe it was a miracle. Maybe Jesus was really compelling. Maybe they were just excited that a rabbi was showing interest in them. Could have been any one of those things or maybe even some other ones. Okay, the next question that you guys submitted has to do with the temptations that Jesus faced. So Jesus goes into the wilderness after he's baptized and he goes through three temptations. And the question is, why these three exact temptations? Is there a significance behind the type of temptation that was chosen by Satan? And why was it those three temptations? Why doesn't like, why isn't there a sexual temptation? Why isn't there a financial temptation? Why is it just those three? Well, there is a lot that we could say about this and why Jesus was tempted in the way he was and what it means. But here's what I can tell you. All three of these temptations that Jesus faced, and if you're not familiar with them, I'll run through them quickly. He had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So the devil shows up and says, hey, if you have all power as the son of God and you're really hungry, why don't you command the stones on the ground to become bread? And then Jesus responds very famously, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes, word that comes from the mouth of God. So turn stones to bread. Second one is the devil takes him up to the very pinnacle, the, the top, the highest part of the temple in Jerusalem. They like pew, zap there. Suddenly they've teleported to the top and the devil says, hey, there's a verse in the book of Psalms that says God won't allow his anointed one to be hurt at all. If you were to throw yourself off the top of the temple right now, then uh, angels would come and they would catch you and you would like glide to the ground real nicely. So why don't you do that? And Jesus says you shouldn't tempt the Lord your God. And then uh, finally, the Bible says that the devil takes Jesus up on a mountaintop and he shows him the splendor of the city of Jerusalem. And he says to him, if you'll just bow down and worship me, then I'll give you authority over all of these people. Now, what's really important to recognize is that in each one of these circumstances, the temptation is actually to take a shortcut in the plan that God has for Jesus, right? The temptation, uh, the, the plan was for Jesus to fast for a long period of time so that spiritually he was ready to begin his ministry. And the devil tempts him to take a shortcut to meet his immediate need. But if he does that, he's going to sacrifice the long-term goal. When he takes him up to the top of the temple, if he says, hey, I want you to jump off, the temple was a crowded place. And whether Jesus like, you know, he jumped and there were angels that caught him and floated him down, or if he just like, like, you know, Thor landing on the ground, last action hero style, people would have noticed. And suddenly Jesus would have been on the stage for his miracles and not for his teaching. People would have immediately tried to seize him and make him the Messiah. And that wasn't the plan either. It was going to take three years and it was going to end in death, not in coronation. And so this was a shortcut. Then in the final one, of course, Jesus is going to win authority. He has authority, but he is going to gain authority over all the kingdoms of the earth, but he's not going to do it by submitting to Jesus. He's going to, uh, by submitting to Satan, he's going to do it by overcoming Satan through death and resurrection. So each of these three temptations were shortcuts in the plan that God had laid out for Jesus. And so Jesus avoids each of them because they would have shortcutted not only uh, what God was trying to do in Jesus, but in the rest of us as well. Now, the, the book of Hebrews says some pretty interesting stuff. Hebrews tells us that our high priest, Jesus, has been tempted in every way that we have been tempted, yet he's without sin. That's a bold statement. And the writer of Hebrews tells us this so that we would have confidence that Jesus knows what we're going through. He knows what it's like for people to be obnoxious and sometimes you just want to crack them upside the head. Jesus knows what the, he knows the temptation to tell people they're idiots. Jesus knows the temptation of like, where is God in the middle of my circumstances? What did he say on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? So the writer of Hebrews is trying to communicate to us, Jesus really does know what we're going through. But this gets weird, okay? Because um, the specific question that's posed here is like, well, why wasn't Jesus tempted with sexual temptation? 
the first thing we have to consider is, A, we don't know that Jesus never was sexually tempted in his life. Um, Jesus never married. He never had any romantic involvement with any women, despite what, like, the Da Vinci Code might try to tell you or something like that. Uh, Jesus never had any sort of romantic relationships. But that doesn't mean that in his humanity, there was never a time in which Jesus was not attracted or was attracted to a beautiful woman. We just, we, we don't know that, but we know that he was tempted and he suffered the frailties of humanity in nearly every other way that we can, we can normally um, have to deal with. And so it seems pretty natural to believe that perhaps Jesus could have been tempted in this way. Now, it's important to remember the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted but never sinned. So, if Jesus appreciated the beauty of some woman, maybe there was even a part of him that was like, oh, I wish I could get married and wow, to have a family and things like that. Um, even if that's the case, Jesus never sat around mentally undressing the women in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? He may have had attraction, but yet he was without sin. Here's the truth in this question and many others that are like it. We tend to want Jesus to go through the exact same sorts of temptations that we ourselves struggle with so that we can have confidence that Jesus really does understand what we're going through. He knows how I feel. But listen, the scriptures tell us that he does, that he was tested uh, tested and tempted with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, all three categories of sin. So Jesus was able to overcome. He understands, and the book of Hebrews tells us he even sympathizes with our weakness. But uh, yeah, the temptations were not so much, or at least the ones in the wilderness, were not so much about Jesus trying to experience every temptation there is in the world on our behalf, but rather these were all variations on the same temptation to take a shortcut in God's calling in his life. All right, hope that helps. Next question. Um, so this is an interesting one. Somebody was reading really closely here, thinking about the temptations of Christ. Uh, the question is, why does Matthew say that the three temptations happen in one order, but then Luke says they happen in a different order? Okay, so if you read them in Luke, it's turn stones into bread, top of the temple, and then bow down and worship Satan. If you read in Luke, it's stones to bread, bow down, and then top of the temple. So which is it? Is this a contradiction? Why can't the two gospel writers get their story straight? What's going on here? Well, this is a case in which each gospel writer is communicating the whole truth, but they're shaping the truth so that a certain aspect of that truth is highlighted. So Matthew communicates in the words that he uses. If you go back and you read it in the Greek language, he uses words that indicate sequence. So it's like first this happened, then this happened, finally this happens, okay? So he's very chronological. But when we read Luke, Luke is instead kind of summarizing everything that Jesus went through, but he's not concerned with telling it in the precise order that it happens. And in fact, the words that he uses are like, Jesus was tempted to turn bread uh, stones into bread, and he was tempted to turn uh, to throw himself down from the top of the temple, and he was tempted to bow down and worship Satan. So he's not giving us a chronology. He's just saying these are the three ways in which Jesus was tempted. So this isn't a contradiction. They both record the exact same temptations. They're told in a slightly different way, but in reality, they harmonize quite nicely. So there's a little bit about what that difference is all about. Next question you guys submitted has to do with uh, Matthew chapter number 7. And this I thought was a really interesting question, and I bet many of you wrestle with this sort of thought. So in Matthew chapter number 7, verse 23, uh, this passage seems to contradict other parts of Scripture that tell us that we are saved by faith and not by works. Well, which is it? How can both types of passage be true? Now, if you're unfamiliar with this passage, I'm going to read it for you. I didn't, I forgot to pull it up. I'm sorry, on a window, a browser window here, but I'll just read it to you. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Here's the passage that the questioner is referring to. Jesus says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven 
but only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, and we perform many other miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. So the question is, like, Jesus is clearly saying here that we have to do what God wants us to do, otherwise we can't go to heaven. That means that my behavior is a factor in whether or not I'm saved. My behavior matters as to whether or not I get to cross those pearly gates. Obviously, right? Well, not quite. Pay very close attention to what Jesus said there. He said the only people who will get into heaven are those who do the will of the Father. Now, if Jesus never explained what the will of the Father is and what he meant by that, then you might assume it means keeping all the rules, making God happy, not screwing up. The problem, though, is that Jesus does specifically tell us what the will of the Father is. And so if you were to go read in John chapter number 6, verse 29, this is what Jesus says. He says, The only thing my Father wants from you is to believe in the one he sent. That's it. The only work that God wants us to do is to believe in the one that he sent. So now harmonize those two passages, those two sayings together. Jesus says the only person that's going to go to heaven is the one who does what God wants. Now, Don't misunderstand because what God wants is for us to believe in Jesus. And in fact, we know that this is what Jesus meant because when we look at these people on judgment day, they're standing before God and Jesus is like, I never knew you. What are they saying to justify themselves, right? Like they're standing in front of Jesus. Jesus is like, hey guys, why should I let you in? And they're like, well, look at all the stuff I did for you, Jesus. I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons. I did miracles. I set up chairs on Sunday morning, man. I was hustling hard for your kingdom's sake. The problem is that's not what God wants from us. The only thing the Father wants from us is to believe in the one that he sent. That's the only thing that matters in terms of our eternity and our relationship with God. Everything else flows from that one thing. So rather than Jesus teaching a salvation that's based on works, it's the exact opposite. Jesus is consistently teaching salvation by grace. Every single time Jesus teaches about what it means to enter into the kingdom of heaven and enter into the afterlife, It's always based on God's mercy and grace and not our accomplishments. Or as I always say, God's love is based on his character and not our behavior. Okay, a few more questions that you guys submitted. Thanks for sticking around. You guys are doing great tonight. Appreciate that. Um, Okay, this is an interesting one and it kind of ties in with the next question that's coming here. What does the title Son of Man mean? If anything, wouldn't Jesus be the father of man? Like if John chapter number one is correct and Jesus created all of this stuff because he existed from eternity past with the father in heaven, why does he call himself constantly the son of man? That seems to downplay his deity. That seems to to indicate that he's just a guy and maybe Christians throughout the centuries have amplified and built a myth around who he was. All right. Son of Man is a title, and it's a very specific title. It has its roots in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, also, I believe, the book of Isaiah. And so when we go back to those places, which are the first moments or the first places that the phrase or title Son of Man occurs, it is a very clear reference to God, okay? So it's a weird way to phrase it because we see the word man and we just believe it means human, but that's not it. In fact, Daniel equates the the title son of man with the title ancient of days. And ancient of days is used elsewhere in the Old Testament and is very clearly linked to Elohim, the word that is translated as God, and it's clearly linked to Yahweh, the personal name of God. And so while we might miss out on this connection, uh, some people might miss out on this connection, you and I know better because we just spent 14 months studying the Old Testament. And so we're able to pick up on these connections that other people might miss. 
Again, rather than son of man downplaying his deity, it actually elevates his deity. And every Jew who knew the Old Testament would absolutely understand what Jesus was saying. And so this is a strong claim about Jesus being God and being God, the same God from the Old Testament. All right. It's uh, one more thing to point out is that if you notice, son of man is always capitalized. It's never like small, lowercase s, lowercase m. It's always capital S, capital M. And, and that's a way for the scripture, for the translators to help us to understand this is a title and not just a description. It is linked back to something important there in the Old Testament. And if you want to understand its meaning, then you're going to have to go back and connect the dots there. Okay. Now, the next question really flows kind of the same from the same thing. We've got these two phrases that are often used to refer to Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man. So what is it? How do these two play out together? The question that was submitted is, why do we, why do Jesus, why do the scriptures refer to him as the Son of God? Doesn't this almost contradict the premise of a triune God who is composed of three equal and eternal persons? Man, somebody's been reading some theology books. After all, fathers create sons and have authority over them. So why is it that Jesus is referred to as the Son? Is that a way of saying that God created him? There was a point he didn't exist and then a point he did because God created him. Is that a way of saying that the son is eternally submitted in authority, in power, in status to the father? Um, the short answer is no. Okay. Now, when we see the word son, we tend to think of it in family relationships like DNA. We tend to think of it in like progenitors. He's my father. He gave, he didn't give birth to me. Men don't give birth. Um, you know, he helped, he brought me into existence along with my mom. That's the way that we think of the word son. But the word son was much broader in the ancient Middle East, the, the culture in which this was written. And so in the ancient Middle East, the word son could be used of biological children, and it was also used for people that were brought into the family and they were given great wealth and status and authority in the family. Now stay with me. In Jesus' day, if you were the firstborn son of a family, you did not have less authority than the father. You actually had equal authority with the father. You were his representative and what you said went People, if they dealt with you, it was the exact same thing as dealing with the patriarch of the father and uh, of the family. And when the father passed away, you as the firstborn were going to receive the lion's share of the inheritance. You were heir to basically everything that the father had. So when Jesus is again and again called the son of God, there is a sense in which he was the son as a human because God the Father uh, or God the Holy Spirit brought him about in the Immaculate Conception there. That's true. But more importantly, the way it's used by the New Testament writers is that this is the Son of God. He speaks on God's behalf. He, it, like when we deal with him, we're dealing with God. He has the authority. He's the heir to everything the Father has. This is a way of God using an ancient custom, the law of primogeniture, in order to help us to understand the authority and the gravitas that the words and actions of Jesus actually carried. Again, this is another one of those times where our modern understanding of the word was very different than the ancient understanding and the, the phrase, the word was used with this ancient sense in mind. And so that's a little bit about what it means to be um, the son of God. Now, beyond that, and this is where, again, it gets really interesting, Jesus makes it abundantly clear several times in his ministry that he has purposefully become submissive to the Father. Now, he is equal with God the Father. The, the, the Trinity is three co-equal, co-eternal, co-powerful uh, persons. And yet, Jesus chooses to submit himself to the will of the Father. If you read in Philippians 2, we've got this great passage called the kenosis passage. Paul talks about how Christ, when he came to earth, he emptied himself 
of a lot of his rights, of his power, of his authority, whatever. We don't even know how far that goes and really quite what it means. But in some very real way, Jesus, and he, he kenosis himself so that when he came to earth, he could relate to us and set an example for us. And so Jesus is basically acting out the way that we are all supposed to act towards God. Submitted, trusting in his power, following his words, even when we don't have all the answers. That's what Jesus did. He came to set that example for us, and he did it perfectly when we weren't able to. And so that's a little bit about why he's called the Son of God, what it means, and maybe even a little bit about what it doesn't mean. Okay? If you have more questions about that, let me know. We can dive back into it. All right. This is an interesting question. I've been asked this one before. Uh, are the demons described in the book of Matthew actually demons, or is it possible that the demon-possessed people that Jesus healed had severe mental illness, schizophrenia, hallucinations, and that just wasn't fully understood at the time. So the Bible says Jesus cast a demon out of somebody. Is it possible that they were just schizophrenic, hearing voices in the same way that schizophrenics do today? Uh, or was this actually demon possession? So um, there's a lot that's been written about this, and none of us can be totally sure of the answer. What, what I'll say is this. Uh, the demonic is real, okay? From a scriptural perspective, there are demons and there are people who become possessed um, permanently, temporarily, whatever it might be, by demonic forces. That is a reality. And it's very clear that many of the people that Jesus cast demons out of actually were demon-possessed because Jesus has interactions with the evil spirits themselves conversations, sends them into a herd of swine. Like, you know, it's very clear that from a scriptural perspective, those were real demons and not merely misdiagnosed mental illness. On the other hand, mental illness is very real. And most of what we know about mental illness, the people in Jesus' day had no idea about whatsoever. And so it's entirely possible that some of the people that were described as having a demon in the scripture had epilepsy or they were schizophrenic or psychotic. And man, if they had lithium, maybe that would have solved the problem. But Jesus knew exactly what they needed, and he healed them both of their possessions and of their diseases. Jesus was able to do both. And so I don't think we should get too caught up into like which was going on in this circumstance or scenario, because that doesn't really matter. They had a terrible, miserable life in which they had some sort of affliction that Jesus freed them from. That's what we're supposed to take away from the story. And let's not also forget that it's entirely possible for somebody to be mentally ill and demon-possessed, right? Like, uh, it, it, it could be that those coexist in greater proportion than, uh, you know, demon possession just exists on its own. Any of that is entirely possible. Good question. All right. Oh, man. Here we go. This is a big one. I wasn't too sure how to get into this one or how much to get into it, but we're just going to do it because you guys asked, so let's say it, okay? My old church believed that Mary was a virgin for her whole life. They say that Mary uh, had no other children and that any time the Bible speaks of Jesus and his brothers or sisters, it means his cousins. So the question is, is that true? Did Jesus really not have any brothers and sisters? Was Mary a virgin both before, during, and after the, the birth or the, the, the life of Jesus. Okay, so there are a couple of um, streams of Christianity that believe some variation or version of this. The most famous is the Catholic Church, and this is likely uh, the church that you went to when you were growing up. The Catholic Church believes in four dogmas, four like bold statements about Mary, and one of them is backed up by the New Testament, and the others are backed up by Catholic teaching and tradition, but they don't find any support in the New Testament itself. So here are the four Marian dogmas, quickly, okay? The first one is that Mary was the mother of God, and we agree with that. 
Totally. That's what the New Testament says. The book of Matthew goes to great lengths. The book of Luke does as well to help us to see that Mary was the mother, the vessel by which Jesus came into the world. So we agree on that. But Catholics also have a few other beliefs that we might disagree with. So they believe that Mary was immaculately conceived just as Jesus was. Okay. So yes, Jesus was born from a virgin and they believe that Mary was also born as a result of a non-sexual act. That God implanted Mary in her mother's womb in the same way that Jesus was implanted in Mary's womb. Now that's a little bit of a, you know, a simplification. I'm sure if you're Catholic or you're well-versed in the Catholic teachings, you'll tell me the areas in which I might have gotten that a little bit wrong. But that's one of the Marian dogmas. And the truth is there is absolutely nothing. I mean like nothing whatsoever in the scripture that communicates that. There's no verses that say it. There's nothing that even hints at it. Instead, some Catholic theologian was thinking about it hundreds of years after the events happened. And he was like, you know what? If there's such a thing as original sin, that is we are born with a sin nature, how could Mary have carried a sin nature and not have passed it on to Jesus? Well, the only way to get around that would be for Mary to have also been immaculately conceived. The problem with that line of argument, of course, is, well, then what about Jesus' grandma and great-grandma? We could go all the way back. Like, at some point, somebody had original sin, and it had to be passed on. So, um, yeah, that's one of the main doctrines that Catholics believe about Mary. And the simple fact is there's nothing in the Scripture to back that up. They've got two more. One is that Mary was a perpetual virgin. They believe, they actually believe that Mary and Joseph never had sex at all, ever, right? Not before Jesus was born, not after Jesus was born. That because Mary was such a special and chosen vessel, that it would have defiled her in order to have any sort of sex. And Joseph was too righteous of a man, he would not have done that, and they certainly didn't have any children. Well, again, the problem is there's literally nothing in the Bible that would lead us to believe that. And in fact, there are several places like the one that's referenced here in the book of Matthew that specifically says that Jesus had both brothers and sisters. Now, the question is like, were they really brothers and sisters? Maybe they were like some other kind of family members, like cousins or something like that. And um, while the word that's used in the Gospel of Matthew could mean literally brother or sister, it could also mean some undetermined close family member. There's no reason to take it at anything other than the literal reading that these were Jesus' brothers and sisters. That after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had many other kids together, brothers and sisters. One of them was named James, and he went on to write the book of James later on in the New Testament. And then the final Marian dogma, like the last teaching that they have, is that uh, it's called the Assumption of Mary. And there's a little bit of disagreement about what exactly this looked like and how it worked and stuff. But essentially, Catholics believe that Mary never died. She was just like translated to heaven. She was kind of just, I don't know, teleported, sucked up there uh, to heaven without having to experience physical death. Now, there are a few people in scripture that, uh, that had that happen to them. There are a few people that were translated directly from life to the afterlife without ever having to die. But there is nothing in the New Testament that would lead us to believe that that happened. And in fact, the first time anybody started talking about it seriously was only a couple of hundred years ago. So like uh, this is a very new doctrine and it certainly doesn't find its grounding in there. So did jo uh, Mary and Joseph have other children? Did Jesus have brothers and sisters? Everything that we read in the New Testament would lead us to believe the answer is yes. And the only reason that anybody would believe differently is because they have an unbiblical view of sex and family, that those things are somehow earthly or dirty or tainted and couldn't be a part of the Holy Family, which is absolute nonsense. Okay, a few more questions here. Um, all right, this is a very common one, and I think we can answer it really quickly. Um, so in Matthew chapter 12, verse uh, 40, <clears throat> the scripture tells us that the period between Jesus' death and resurrection was three days long, and yet if you count like Friday afternoon to Saturday to Sunday morning, that's like at most 36 hours. It's 
definitely not three full days. So why is it that the Bible says Jesus was in the ground for three days when he wasn't in the ground for anywhere near three days? Well, the short answer is that um, our when we think that way, we're thinking from a Western perspective, a Western mindset. And so for us, when we say three days, we think like three either 24-hour periods or at least substantially uh, three 24-hour periods. But in an Eastern or a Jewish mindset, if an event occurs at any point during a day, that day is counted as being a part of the time frame. So like Jesus was put into the ground before the sun went down on Friday. He spent all day there on Saturday. So Friday's one day, according to the Jewish way of accounting. Saturday is the second day. And then we read that just after the sun rose, so just for the tiniest little bit of Sunday morning, Jesus was still in the tomb before he was revealed in resurrection. And so that would be the third day. So when the Bible says he spent three days in the ground, it's not that he spent 70, is it 72? Oh man, my math whatever it is. It's not that he spent three 24-hour periods in the ground, but that he spent portions of three days within the tomb. That's what it means. Okay. Um, in Matthew chapter number 15, verse 26, Jesus is a jerk, or at least it sounds that way. Uh, the question here is, why does Jesus compare Gentiles to dogs? Why does he call them dogs in this passage? But then later, he's going to advocate for them. He's going to say that, you know, they're heirs of grace and, you know, they can be saved and all that sort of stuff. So why, why does Jesus use this language? Let me read the passage for you. Matthew chapter number 15, verse 26. Actually, we'll bump back up here. Uh, verse 21. Um, <clears throat> the Bible tells us, A Gentile woman who lived in the city came to him, pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Now, she's a Gentile. That means she's not Jewish. She's not a part of the, the faith. But Jesus gave, Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell that lady go away, they said. She's bothering us with all of her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, that is, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. And then in verse 26, this is where Jesus says the weird thing. He responded to her, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. So essentially it's like he's saying here, uh, I was sent to heal and to help Israelites and they're the children of God and you guys are like dogs, you're second class citizens and uh, you don't really belong. So I can't take what I was supposed to give to them and give it to you. But she replied, that may be true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great and your request is granted. And her daughter was healed instantly. Okay, so what's going on here? Like, why in the world was Jesus so harsh? Why did he call this woman a dog? Like, don't you don't, like, Jesus, you got to know, you don't call females dogs, man. That's, that's not good, right? Okay. Uh, this might seem really harsh, but let me tell you, Jesus always had a soft spot for Gentiles. If you look at the way that he interacted with people who were outside of the faith, he always treats them better than he treats people inside the faith, faith every single time, okay? So he's got this soft spot for sure for Gentiles. Now, here's what I think is going on. Jesus is actually saying what everybody would expect a good observant Jew to say. To say, nope, you're not an heir to God's promise, therefore you have no part in what he's giving out. You can't have his grace, you can't have his mercy, you can't have his miracles. So sorry, you were born into the wrong family. Every Jewish rabbi would have said that. Every observant Jew would have had that attitude. And so Jesus is voicing what she expected him to say and what everybody else expected him to say. But immediately... He gives her what she wants, which is the exact opposite of what everybody would have expected the Messiah to do. So I think Jesus is subverting expectations here. I think he's basically teeing up a softball and then he's going to knock it out of the park. He's saying, look, everybody thinks I'm supposed to push you away because you're a Gentile. In fact, I'm even going to say it. So the people who are listening or the people who are reading later are like, yeah, that is exactly the way Gentiles should be treated. And then... I'm going to give her exactly what she wants, and everybody's going to be like, oh my gosh, what is he doing? Doesn't he know? We're not supposed to treat Gentiles that way, except 
Jesus came to proclaim the good news for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, man and woman alike, rich and poor, white and black, doesn't even matter. And so this is Jesus' way of setting up our expectations and then completely subverting them. All right. Matthew 16, 8. Um, this is an interesting question, okay? Matthew 16, 8. Why did Jesus say that he would return in the disciples' lifetime? Clearly, he did not return in the disciples' lifetime. So why did he say that he would? Well, Matthew chapter 16, verse 8 says this. Jesus is speaking. Uh, sorry, let me find it. That is not the right verse. We got the wrong reference here. Sorry, guys. Oh, here is verse 28, Matthew 16, 28. Uh, it says this, Jesus is speaking, uh, we'll back up to verse 27, he says, For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge the people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So he's talking to the disciples, he says, some of you are not going to die before you see me come into my kingdom. Now, you might be wondering, like, well, wait a sec, uh, Jesus did not return. His second coming didn't happen before the apostles died. So did Jesus make a false prophecy here? And the answer is absolutely not. This is an instance where we read what Jesus is saying and we assume we know what he means or we read into a meaning that actually isn't there. So when Jesus says, uh, some of you standing here right now will not die before you see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom, we interpret that phrase to mean his second coming. But in reality, that's not at all what Jesus is talking about. If you skip ahead to the very next verse, chapter 17, verse 1, uh, six days later, Jesus took Peter and two brothers, James and John. He led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, his, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with him. He will skip down. Even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice from the cloud said, the same as it did at baptism, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell down on the ground. Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus as he was. So we've got the transfiguration of Jesus, and it happens immediately after Jesus says, some of you, before your life is over, you're going to see me come into my kingdom. You are going to see me as I really am. You are going to see me as God in the flesh, the second member of the Trinity. And so I think that he's actually referring to the transfiguration here. There are other theologians that believe he's referring to the resurrection, and some of the disciples, namely Judas, died before that happened. But nobody who is familiar with the teachings actually believes he was referring to the second coming. Don't read that interpretation into the text because it's simply not there. Okay, final question. We went a full hour tonight. Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. I need a drink of water. Sorry. Final question about the transfiguration itself. Obviously, this is an awesome and miraculous moment, but what was the significance of the transfiguration? What was the point and why did uh, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus? All right. The answer is that um, Jesus was revealing himself to the disciples so that when everything that was going to come in the next few weeks, his um, arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, three days in the tomb, when all of that was going on, the disciples would have some sort of anchor memory in which they could be certain that Jesus was more than just a man. And he was more than a trickster who did some, you know, interesting tricks and convinced people he could work miracles. He wanted to show them something that would give them confidence that even when it seemed like he had lost, he was still going to win. And so he reveals himself in full glory. And the Bible says there that Elijah and Moses appear, and the reason is very important. 
okay, we just spent 14 months studying the Old Testament. And we know that in general, there are two big sections of the Old Testament. The first is the law, and the second is the prophets, right? The law and the prophets. And we see in the New Testament, the Old Testament is often, in the New Testament, the Old Testament is often referred to as the law and the prophets. Moses is the author of the law, and Elijah is the most prominent, or one of the most prominent, of the prophets. He becomes the stand-in for all the other prophets. So Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets, and by them being there, essentially it's saying, this is the Messiah. This is the guy that has been promised since Genesis 3, right? From the very beginning, this is the one that you guys have been waiting for. In fact, everything Moses wrote and everything the prophets had to say were all pointing towards Jesus, God, his son, the savior of the world. And so that's who they are. That's why they were there. It was to say the Old Testament has been pointing towards Jesus this whole time. Oh my gosh, you guys, you got me sweating tonight. We did a lot of questions. That was like 25 questions, but we blasted through them. Thank you guys for submitting them. It is not a big deal to me. I am super glad to answer them. We are on to the book of Luke. Now listen, don't get um, freaked out, overwhelmed, or think it's unimportant to stick with each of the four Gospels. Because although they tell many of the same stories, there are actually different stories and different. they're told different ways between each one. So stick around. Make sure you watch the overview video for the book of Matthew, Mark. Did I say Luke? We're on Mark next. Uh, we'll do Mark, and then we'll get to Luke and John, and I can't wait to have those discussions, learn more about Jesus. In the meantime, I'm here for you guys. If you've got questions about faith, if you need somebody to pray for you, just shoot me a message, and I'd be glad to do that. Thank you for joining me tonight. Hope you have an amazing week.